Okay, let's start then. I will talk today about hydrology through the lens. Um, and the seminar will be about the use of mainly thermal infrared imaging for the use in hydrological modeling and hydro hydrological process research. Um, and um, what I want to say first is that there is a wide range of YouTube videos on the Birmingham, um, on, I think on the, it's a World Water Day channel. So have a look at them. I watched some this morning. Um, I also want to say thank you to a bunch of uh, co-workers on this, um, on the research that made up the seminar, which is mainly relying on the work of the PhD, uh, two PhD students, which is Barbara Glaser and Marta Antonelli. So a big thanks goes to them for their really nice work. And also contributing directly was Laurent Pfister and Louisa Hopp. And um, what I will talk about today is um, two, two main topics. On the one side, I will talk about how do we observe surface saturation in the field or in uh, watersheds um, with novel technology and how do we use this kind of information for hydrological modeling or vice versa, how do we um, simulate this surface saturation patterns in, in watersheds. Why is it important in general? I mean, I guess if you live in England, you know surface saturation a lot or in, in, in Central Europe, it's a key driver of hydrological processes in many landscapes. You see on the photo, which is from the Weyerbach catchment in Luxembourg, you have the stream channel there in a forested headwater catchment, and you see already visually that there is a pronounced wetland or saturated area along the stream channels. And during rainfall events, of course, you have either surface um, so, uh, usually saturation excess surface runoff in those catchments. You can often come into Hortonian surface runoff around those, catch, uh, around those saturated areas, but it's really critical with the um, surface saturation excess because you have rainfall that directly falls on the saturated patches and can thus directly enter the stream channel, really creating a runoff response and um, depending on the extent of the saturation, lead to downstream flooding in the, for example, in the lowlands or in the lower part of the headwater. In addition, those um, saturated areas along the stream channel in the riparian zone are often a hot spot for biogeochemical reactions. And if they wet or if it rains on them, they really contribute to the biogeochemistry of the stream or the water chemistry in general. So it's a very important landscape element that has been the subject of research over the last 50 years uh, in many landscapes, but there are still many things to understand in relation to observation and modeling. So at, at first I want to show you a little bit, or I want to talk about <clears throat> how we use thermal infrared uh, imaging or, the, or imagery to detect those um, surface saturation in the field. This is an example, um, again, from the Weyerbach research catchment. You see on the one side with the colored ones on the left, that's a thermal photograph. And on the right side, you see just the visual image. And you can already see if you compare both pictures, you see the stream channel on the visual one and you see then on the left a distinct certain or a distinct temperature range um, related to that surface water. But even if you look around the stream, you start seeing that um, there is material of the same color um, hidden below the, the vegetation or not really clearly visible, visible from visible from the um, visual photo. And based on this information, 
one can start translating the, the temperature information into a surface saturation. And this is done in a couple of steps. One usually goes out, like at the top picture, takes the visual photo and the thermal infrared photo. And by image processing with, obviously you need ground truth. So if you go to the field, you should, lay, you should check locations where you're sure that the surface is saturated and that can lead as guidance for this gray image processing where you can assign certain temperature information to certain uh, to a saturation on or to non-saturated areas and in the third step you can create then what i labeled here with the e this is the, the in the end the binary information of areas in this case black that are saturated and areas colored that are non-saturated And how precise is working like that here? I show you that's more technical, but I think it's important to know. I sh um, show some examples in C and D of a grayscale thermal infrared image. And at the bottom, you see like temperature curves. Um, what one needs to do when you process this imagery for surface saturation is define a temperature range based on the ground truth that you define in the image as saturated. And depending how you define that, this is usually the blue colors, um, you get a certain uncertainty. You see on the left side that small changes can lead to larger uncertainty, while on the right side, where yellow is saturated and gray is unsaturated in those images, you can also have situations depending on this the, the distribution of the temper measured temperatures in one image, you get a higher or smaller uncertainty. So you never can fully, or important to know is that all our images that are processed like that have intrinsic uncertainty due to the image processing. So how we use some of those images. At first I was still show you some work of the Weyerbach research catchment that you see on the left side of the figure, which is located in uh, the northwest of Luxembourg. It's a half square kilometer catchment. Uh, at the bottom, you see a typical view on the stream channel and the wetland systems. And on the right side, you then already see a model application or a translation into a, a th three-dimensional model of the system, but that's only um, a part of the system, as you can see with the red arrows on the left side, about um, um, it's a small headwater with six hectares that has been used in that study. So what do we do? We use a three-dimensional rigid-based model with a certain grid size that you see at the bottom right, um, with a very detailed grid resolution in the riparian area and the stream channel, where we really simulate the processes on centimeter scale, while we choose a wider resolution the further we go away from the stream channel. And in this case, we wanted to test how, how can we improve our hydrological models if we count for surface saturation. On the left side, you see the input data, which is precipitation, but you also see the observed and the simulated discharge in the top panel. And over uh, two hydrological years or one and a half years. And at the bottom, you see some simulation of soil moisture. And in this case, we started the simulation where we step-by-step -step validated the model um, parameters with adding information. At first, we validated or we validated the model against discharge until that was satisfying with some model parameters we went to um, validate against um, soil moisture. And in the last step here, you see a wide um, thermal infrared image over a whole riparian zone about, that's about 20 meters in length. And we had thermal infrared photos every couple of weeks. 
and we translated that into a binary information. On the right side in black and yellow, you see this thermal infrared information. And on the left side in, uh, in black and white, you see the results from the model. And we did then for every time we had an image, we validated or we did a visual validation of the saturation um, simulated against observed and could conclude that our mo model is much more robust if we are able to find a parameter setup or constrain our parameters more robust to be able to recapture how the spatial patterns of surface saturations are. In the next step, um, maybe more interested for the um, experimental um, scientists is again the Weyerbach catchment, now in its full size, and we selected here um, seven different riparian areas or saturated areas, and we performed a two-year field campaign with approximately weekly to bi-weekly observation of surface saturation in all these areas. They were different in terms of their landscape position. So we had a range of um, saturated areas that were really the source of the stream with, with permanent springs. We had saturated areas along the stream channel with springs and we had saturated areas along the stream channel without springs. And you see always one visual photo where the yellow arrow in indicates the stream direction. You see um, the thermal infrared image, often with a red circle that indicates a spring in the system. And then you have a more binary information where we really worked out the, the, the saturation. And based on that, um, running the cameras, you often get unexpected visitors, which is also important. I still don't know who the person was in the upper left picture. Um, and then you can figure out what kind of animals uh, show up once in a while. I think one of our sites was the spa for the wild boars of Luxembourg. So they really went in there and kind of partied every other week. Uh, sadly changing the surface topography that we just measured with uh, a LIDAR. Um, this is not, th those pictures are not from the weekly um, manual um, image acquisition, but we also installed at some of the sites um, permanent installed cameras that actually monitored for one week every 50 to 60 minutes but I do not show any of this data because that we're still in the processing. Um, but back to the, the signs, you see here um, on the top left, you see the discharge and the stream, uh, the discharge and the rainfall over a period of about two years. And then you see the saturation as a normalized saturation for the different studied um, saturated areas and um, they are separated into the different landscapes. The red one on the left is the spring areas. On the right side I show the, the, the saturated areas along the stream channel with and without springs and you can see that in general the dynamic is relatively consistent with very high saturation in spring 2016 and then drying out over the summer reaching the lowest saturation extent in early 2017 then somewhat extending and drying out again 2017 was a dry year although most year, uh, most summers have been rather dry 17 18 and yeah seven especially 17 and 18 and then in two, early 2018, you see a rapid increase of surface saturation, but this was uh, associated with a rain on snow event where the detection of saturation with the thermal infrared images is a little bit more challenging. 
uh, I save you the technical details there. But interestingly, all or luckily, all areas are showing a similar dynamic, but not perfectly similar. Here you see um, violin plot that's uh, from Martyr's recent hydrological process paper. And you see a clear difference between the different landscape position. Again, the PSA are the headwater or the, the source areas of the stream where the stream channel usually appears above those locations. We do not have a stream channel or we have a channel, but we never saw flow there um, in the last decade or probably much longer. Um, and you start seeing that the different, pad, uh, the different landscape positions show different kind of dynamics in terms of their saturation. They are more precise, some are show larger extent and some are much more stable in the extent, especially around the source areas. We have much more stable saturation. Um, in the next step, one can, um, I won't talk much about that, relate this, this is work again from Marta Antonelli. Um, this relates, uh, this is the, you can see on the right side, the stream channel in the black lines. And you can see what we did here. We did frequent campaigns approximately every two weeks where we measured discharge increase stepwise. So we had sections of about 50 meters of stream length and we did salt dilution gauging from the uh, main stream gauge up to the springs on a day. And we always compared that to the saturation dynamic. And there is, besides that there is, especially at base flow, a strong topographic control on how much stream flow is gained between measurement points. You can also see um, a rather strong impact of those saturation areas on, on the increase of stream flow with scale. Looking at the more spatial, dyna uh, temporal dynamic of those um, saturated areas, here's one example. Black again indicates the saturation. Colored again indicates um, non-saturated areas. And I show you over about 18 months the dynamic of the saturation. It's a bit fast, so I play it again. So we start in, 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 late, uh, in late fall or mid fall and then move through the year to summer and again into wet up. And you can already see that about a year later, the catchment seems to be much drier. The extent of surface saturation is, is much smaller. And based on an information like that, one can create maps of uh, frequency of saturation or fraction of time that is saturated. Um, and you can see that the, the, the weather spots are in the stream channel itself. So the persistent blue is where the stream channel is actually um, located. And you can see that parts of the, the channel flow around 90% of the year. But you can also see that you have, especially on the upper part, I don't have a pointer, on the upper part of the figure, you can see that um, you have areas that can be saturated half of the year. It's often exfiltrating groundwater that creates um, a saturated patch that then contributes to the generation of floods downstream. You can have that also for kind of different landscape elements um, in that case, which is um, on the left side, you see different riparian zones and on the right side, you see different um, saturation profiles. And uh, you can visually already compare that to the occurrence of the stream channel, but you can also see which areas seem to show a much more persistent saturation, for example, the Upper, satu uh, upper area, the upper photograph, has a much higher saturation outside the stream channel, while the other two seem to focus much of the, the saturation that use at or along the stream channel. So this is like the kind of observation we can do. 
and I want to quickly move into a simulation. What we did here, we again used a three-dimensional surface subsurface model hydrogeosphere. We set up uh, a grid with um, again high grid resolution in this uh, along the riparian zone and stream channel, and then a certain setup based on some geophysical observations that represents the subsurface in the catchment. And again, we simulated discharge, soil moisture, and we again compared now catchment scale wise, we had around, I think 300 um, of those um, saturated area photographs. So we created the fraction of saturation and compared how robust is our model in simulating the, the occurring saturation, not only at the specific site, but also outside, um, not at one site, but on really different saturated areas throughout the catchment. And it, we were rather successful with that, um, being able to simulate in the, the general dynamic of the system, but some parts have been, let's say, s some fine details, of course, could not have been, or we couldn't reproduce all details. But an important point here is this figure on the left side, you see the normalized frequency of surface saturation, the simulated one. And on the right side, you actually see the percentage of time in, in the two year observation period, groundwater reached the surface of the landscape. And you see it's already quite consistent. I move to the next figure where you see in blue the, the, the catchment area that is reached by or where groundwater reaches the surface. In black, you see the simulated surface saturation in terms of catchment scale. And in red, you see the ratio, which is always somewhere around 80%, which means that at most times of the year, 80% of the saturated areas occur where groundwater reaches the surface and the other um, are rainfall processes, very impermeable soil. So we have a little bit of a wider um, occurrence of surface saturation, but it's quite interesting then it, that the Weyerbach research catchment is in a mo mountainous in the Ardennes mountains. It it's, doesn't have a drastic topographic gradient, but on this half square kilometer catchment, we have about 50 meters in elevation um, gain from the outlet to the highest point. But the still the saturation dynamics in the catchment are mainly driven by groundwater that is located in the stream valley, really indicating the relevance of the hill foot and the, the, the near or the river corridor on, on those key processes. Um, here we compare um, to jump out of the Weyerbach on the left side, we actually compare the, the, the percentage of saturated catchment area with the discharge in an area for different catchments throughout the world. And you see you have a rather variability on this log log scale in terms of how much saturation you have and how much discharge or specific discharge a catchment creates. And um, so the Weyerbach is probably more at the lower end. It doesn't have too much saturation, but it can, um, for its saturation, it already produces a rather high specific discharge, which is of course also related to the rainfall amounts. And on the right side, you see the same kind of um, figure or a similar figure for the different saturated areas. And you see that the, the different kind of that we have or that we can observe different types of saturation dynamic. And I think future research really needs to look into more detail. So what drives saturated areas, riparian zone dynamics beyond the simple groundwater level dynamics? So what are the soil moistures, uh, the soil types influence what's the landscape influence on the dynamic contraction and extension because that again exhibits a critical control on stream chemistry. And the last part I want to show you is that we can also look into 
different riparian areas or saturated areas and look where this water is coming from. Here we rely on a mixing cell approach from Dan Partington. Um, and very simple, we have colored um, influxes to a model grid that represent like stream water, rainfall, uh, water from the subsurface, for example, then we mix it in one cell and the outflow is then the mixture of all this kind of information. And in the model, we can track this information through all cells. And then we can look into space and look at a certain point here, this yellow point in one riparian zone or in one wetland. You see on the lower left in uh, the stream hydrograph or the hydrograph at that location. In blue, you see the fraction of stream water, uh, the rainwater at that point in time and uh, or at that point in space. And the brown color indicates all water that contributes to water at that location that is from the subsurface. And with the mixing cell approach, we can further deceiver this kind of sources into water that comes from the bedrock, water that comes from certain type of the soils, and one can even go a step further and look at different locations in space and being able to detect then what type of water are in the stream channel itself and in the riparian zone, where is different types of, or where is the surface saturation coming from? So the water that stands on the surface comes partly from the bedrock, partly from the subsolum, and that really helps us understanding how runoff is generated, or at first how saturation, and then the second step, how runoff is generated in these systems. And you can do that then for different locations, for different time points along the hydrograph, um, so stay tuned for the updates on that research. So with that, I would like to close. Uh, Thank you for joining this live seminar on World Water Day. Watch the other YouTube videos on the channel on the World Water Day. And I have to say a big thank you to many people that contributed to the work, especially Barbara and Marta doing most of the field work and the modeling, but also a wide range of collaborators on the field work and the modeling. So. Um, Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take uh, talks, uh, questions and answer, uh, supply answers via the chat. Um, so thanks for listening. Any questions? Type on the chat, please. So first question, how will we continue the research while we are in lockdown? Luckily, both PhD students submitted their thesis, so they don't need to go um, to the field anymore. For all other projects, we sadly cannot continue any field work at the moment and probably for a long time. So step by step, a question from David. Um, I mentioned that mismatch between observation and simulation may be due to additional factors that groundwater, than groundwater exfiltration and microtopography. So at the moment, um, that's a good question because I think what, what, is, what we do not account for in the model and all those conclusions are made from the model only is um, spatial heterogeneity of the subsurface. What we have is we, while we account for differences between hill slope and riparian zone in terms of the subsurface structure, we just did geo, uh, transects with ERT, uh, so geophysics, 
and we then use a rather uniform depth profile what one could do but that's probably unrealistic is to do a really a detailed geophysical survey for all riparian so or for the whole riparian system and then implement the subsurface structure in very de very much detail but this is i think there we push to the limit of what one can do with such a model again don't forget we run the system on centimeter resolution in along the stream channel so there is another question um, on the temperature sensing by sue um, the the temperature sensing actually only penetrates the the top millimeter so what we can't do is we, we need a certain type of water depth on the surface um, and then we just really penetrate the, the, the top of the topsoil. So there, what you can do with a thermal in, infrared, you can sense the, temp, the leaf temperature, for example, but you couldn't go deeper than leaf level, if that answers your question. Um, then there is a next question. Is there an application um, to degraded systems and restoration, um, particularly in confined urban catchments? I know that there has been some initial work on agricultural systems from some colleagues in Belgium and um, looking at tile drain work. There is some work of those thermal infrared sensing in. Um, in wetlands in it's it's like urban coastal wetlands in new england so there's the there's definitely the possibility to work with the technology in urban systems um yes and see very it's also used for example to detect the exchange between groundwater and surface water and i think that is actually a key problem in urban systems if we think of water temperature the exchange across different ecological interfaces and i think there is a big research gap but there's not much work currently in that field or not enough um, next question um, sorry i'm reading them on the go So there are three questions. The first one is, um, can I comment on the methods to rectify the non-orthogonal images from the mounted cameras? Um, yes, we did that in ArcGIS and um, I hope it works. It's a, it's a, a, the problem of all this processing is that we fall into a manual image processing. That's why it's very hard at the moment to, to process the detail permanently mounted images. There, there is, and we try to collaborate with uh, colleagues from, uh, in Luxembourg from the remote sensing research groups and the um, machine learning in, uh, for algorithms to detect uh, to correct and detect the surface saturation but for now it is more precise if we do it manually the second one is there um, the option for using uavs um, for for that thermal infrared imagery analysis there is a work by Steve Duckdale, who is in Nottingham, or who worked with David Hanna before in Birmingham. There, they mount them on uh, drones, and that work also exists by the University of Strasbourg in France, and they fly over river channels. I think another Finnish group that did also, and one can, um, depending on the application, detect thermal refugees for fish, one can detect surface ground uh, or 
uh, larger scale um, groundwater exfiltration to the streams using uh, um, drones, for example. Um, and the last question, question here is, can the ground truth account for vegetation or woody debris shadowing the saturated areas? Um, what we actually sometimes did is we, we often cut some vegetation. Um, the shadowing effect was not that strong in our catchment, but one needs to carefully select the time. So in the 2018 paper in hydro Hydrology and Earth System Sciences, we um, gave like a guidance what times of the day you need to avoid, what types of temperature contrast you need to avoid in terms to avoid shadowing effects or avoid that air temperature has the same uh, temperature as the water and you just get a uniform temperature profile. But yes, there is some guidance available how to deal with different environmental factors during um, image acquisition. Um. There's a question uh, for, um, by Luca Marazzi for citizen science work. Um, I do collaborate with citizen scientists, but not on a topic like that. There is an interesting project from Jan Seibert from the University of Zurich, um, where they have this, it, it's, an, uh, it's a smartphone app called Crowdwater, and they actually have volunteers detecting or monitoring how the stream channel um, expands and contracts. So they go to certain locations and say the stream channel is dry or the stream channel is wet. And I think these kind of tools are very helpful in detecting um, dynamics of stream channel outside our observation. At the, I think it's very difficult to use citizen science in a forest catchment like that because it's just not enough people that would cross a random stream in our headwater but um, like on more open systems on larger scale I think they're they can be very helpful by detecting the occurrence of saturation or detecting the occurrence of stream flow in a binary form and there is this crowd water app available and I think the, the data collection there is very promising. There's a question, how does um, this work address impact of climate change on water and how do we scale up from headwaters in terms of climate change adaption? Um, thanks, David. This is a really good point. Um, I think what is critical to say here is that headwaters are the um, comprising the majority of all stream length globally. So most streams around the world are located in small headwaters. I, depending on the numbers, you just, people talk 70, 80%. So, so these headwater systems are very critical because we often look into climate change uh, scenarios, often on the larger rivers downstream, but many of the processes actually occur upstream in terms of how much water is translated from rainfall to the stream, how much water is sustained during droughts. There was this talk of Doris on, on, on uh, YouTube about uh, that. So I think it's very important to understand how um, different future um, climate scenarios actually translate into how the landscape changes, the vegetation will change, groundwater levels may be lower. So in many um, systems, we may not have those saturated areas anymore that are important to, to generate runoff, to, to, to maintain stream flow or to process uh, or for the biochemical processes that take place there. So I think it's very critical to understand them and then in the future predict how these kind of wetlands 
uh, or saturated areas or the frequency of saturation changes because that is really critical on how future floods and droughts are maintained in those headwaters. Any further questions? Sounds good, no further questions. I was, I'm was. i also happy that none of the neighbors disturbed the talk with gardening. So um, enjoy the rest of this uh, virtual um, World Water Day and um, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>